Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Can I invite you to please take your seats as we are about to begin? Um, please fill up, uh, move up to fill up the seats. It's free seating. Um, I am Michael Chen from the EDB Society, your MC for this evening. I would first like to share some housekeeping rules. Uh, please turn off your mobile phones during the session. Uh, during the Q&A session, please use the mics on the aisle and introduce yourself and the organization to which you belong before asking the questions. Well, to a good evening, everyone. A very warm welcome to the EDB Society's Enterprise and Entrepreneur Series. Very, very happy to see so many of you here again today for the fourth forum that we are holding under the E-Series. As you know, the E-Series is a six-part initiative undertaken in partnership with the Singapore Management University and with the support of the Economic Development Board. Today, in this forum, the business of living longer and well, we will explore the unstoppable trend that all of us will have to go through, and I pray for all of us as we gracefully age. We will hear from our panelists who are trailblazers in giving us these opportunities to live longer and well. Uh, let me express our special thanks to uh, UOB, our main sponsor, and the supporting organizations, Nippon Paint, Pasta Mania of the Commonwealth Capital Group, Singapore Business Federation, and Sabana Jurong. May I now take this opportunity to invite Mr. Lee Swanghyang, President of the EDB Society, to give his welcome remarks. Mr. Lee, please. <clears throat> Distinguished Fellow of the EDB Society, former Minister Yo Chao Tong, and Mr. Salon Yeo, former ministers, Mrs. Lim Hui Hua and Andy Lim, uh, Li Yishan. We have former ministers, Zan Abidin, Mr. Yi Fu Yishun. I'm just looking around. <laughs> we have many ex MPs here too, distinguished ex MPs. We have uh, Arthur, Cynthia is not quite here yet, Liu Sin Pao, Michael Liu, Dr. Hong Hai, Dr. Sia. Uh, Se Hong. <laughs> we have Viswa. I still remember his maiden speech. And as an NMP, got the attention of senior minister. <laughs> Dei Beng Chuan, also ex NMP. And we have uh, <coughs> Professor Lily Kong, our partner, provost and incoming president of SMU. We have uh, many distinguished. Alumni members of the EDB, we have uh, Liu Heng San, former managing director of EDB, Shirley Chen, former assistant chief executive, and all distinguished fellows of the EDB Society and distinguished friends of the EDB Society and SMU. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the co-organizers, the EDB Society and SMU, let me extend a very warm welcome to all of you to this fourth forum in our Enterprise and Entrepreneur Series. For those of you who are here for the first time, this series was initiated to celebrate our entrepreneurs. I think many of uh, my colleagues from the EDB were involved in the early days in promoting entrepreneurship 30, 40 years ago. And we are all very happy to see that today we have many entrepreneurs making their mark 
not just in Singapore, but around the world. So this series is in a way to celebrate all these inspiring entrepreneurs. It is also a series that we initiated to respond to the future economy. As you know, uh, the government has initiated the future economy report. Uh, the over overarching theme of this series is transforming industries, creating value. We thought, you know, uh, with the inputs from the speakers and from the audience, we could then collate the salient points and give them as our feedback, our inputs to Minister Heng Swikiat, who launched the series. So your inputs today will be very valuable. This is a six-part series, as you have heard. Today, the specific topic is aging, living longer and living well. I was reminded earlier on that we need not fear this topic. I think when we talk about aging, a lot of us look at it negatively, but we have a fine example up north. <laughs> <laughs> that age does not matter, so long as what matters does not age. <laughs> and aging is also good business, because as they say, you know, we, many of us spend our our youth chasing wealth. We spend our health chasing wealth. And when we are old, we spend our wealth chasing health. <laughs> so I think this is good business. And to lead us in the discussion today, we have a very distinguished panel. It will be moderated by SMU professor, uh, Professor Jared George, who is, uh, I think, the Lee Kong Chen Chair Professor for Innovation and Entrepreneurship. And uh, the panel will consist of the movers and shakers in this sector. They come from different sec backgrounds. We have uh, Mr. Ong Chu Po, one of the very early entrepreneurs in elder care. He is the group chairman and ch chief executive of the Econ Healthcare Group. We also have uh, Ms. Janice Chia, who is the Managing Director and, and Founding Managing Director of the uh, Aging Asia Private Limited, a consultancy and organizer of exhibitions and forums on this topic. We have uh, Ms. Ivy Lai, Country Manager of Philips and CFO of uh, ASEAN, Philips ASEAN and, uh, and Pacific. We also have Ms. Dr. Mary Ann Chow, uh, chairman and founding director of the Chow Foundation. And uh, last but not least, we have my very good friend, close friend of EDB, prof former NUS president, and now newly appointed uh, chief health scientist and a director of the new office on healthcare transformation at the MOH, Professor Tan Cho Chuan. B before I hand you over to our moderator, and the panel, I'd like to thank a number of people who have made this series possible. First, the sponsors. They have been very generous, so I must mention their names. The main sponsors, UOB, supporting sponsors, Nippon Paint, Singapore Business Federation, Jurong Sabana, Sabana Jurong, and Pasta Mania. We would also like to thank our partners, the management and staff of SMU and EDB, and also the uh, students from uh, Nanyang Polytechnic who have been here to help us out. But all this would not have been possible without the organizing committee. Our very hardworking organizing committee led very ably by the untiring Miss Daisy Go. <laughs> we have worked very hard not just for this particular forum, but for the whole entire series. So thank you very much to the organizing committee. So without further ado, let me hand you over to Professor Gerald George and the panel. May I now invite the uh, panelists, as well as Professor George, to come on stage. Yep. They are again Ms. Jenny Tia, uh, Ms. Ivy Lai, uh, Mr. Ong Chu Po, uh, Prof. Tan Chua Chuan and Mary, uh, Dr. Marianne Chow.
Welcome to SMU. My name is Jerry George. I'm a professor of innovation and entrepreneurship. Um, given my title of professor of innovation and entrepreneurship, I, I think I was selected because I'm the most handsome dean. Today. <laughs> Thanks to a very kind audience, because even my wife doesn't like that joke anymore. <laughs> but uh, uh, just as I was saying that, uh, one of my friends sitting right up front here uh, said, don't worry, Prof. As the days go by, we all become experts. So uh, for the topic of living longer and well, uh, I just wanted to start by saying um, this session itself, there is a lot of negative framing around aging. And the way we subtly think about aging as a process and uh, aging or aged individuals within society. So typically, the use of statistics gives us a connotation. For example, uh, this particular year in Singapore, um, the number of 15-year-olds or individuals less than 15-year-old is equal to the number who are above 65. And by 2030, it'll be uh, the number of 15-year-olds will be 11%, but the number of uh, um, over 65 will be about 28%. And so there is this ratio that is getting skewed over time. And because of that, a lot of our dialogue tends to be about sort of, and the statistics, I have to thank UOB because I had to look up one of their reports. Um, the statistic typically raises this question of sort of the economic value and the economic cost associated with aging. So what we wanted to do in this panel was to turn that around and then sort of say, what, what do we know about the business of living longer? So what are the, looking at aging as an opportunity and wellness as an opportunity, and then how do we think about this in a different way? So I've got an eminent panel here with me, and the, when I briefed them this, just a few, uh, an hour or so ago, I talked about, you know, we have to talk about living longer with meaning and purpose. And what are the business opportunities or what is the business associated with doing so? Uh, the panelists, in how we've uh, discussed, we are going to give uh, each member of the panel, a distinguished panel, about five or six minutes each. They're going to introduce themselves and they will tell their position. In, they all come from very different backgrounds. We've got entrepreneurs, we've got uh, uh, individuals with consultancies, social work, we've got um, healthcare experts. So we've got a whole domain in terms of the range of skills that we need to have a great conversation on this topic. So I'm going to pass to first have an introduction each and give them five minutes each. And then I've got a set of questions we'll go through uh, and start that uh, discussion. And then we'll pass it on to you uh, for an open Q&A. So welcome to this fantastic panel. Maybe can we just go around once and just introduce ourselves? I think you've got the microphone right there. Uh, Janice, could you start with you? Yeah. So my name is Janice. Um, and I started Aging Asia when I was 30. So now I'm almost 40. Um, and why I did this was because I, I believe that I wanted to change the future of aging, that aging is a social and economic opportunity. Every one of us has someone around us that's aging, and it's something that, that impacts everybody. So when I started my career, I wanted to go into that business. So I, I looked at what was in the aging sector that I wanted to change. Um, what, what was it that we could learn from around the world? So I spent a lot of my time traveling to look at the best elder care models around the world to see how we can accelerate change and development. So through Aging Asia, we bring a network of people from business, governments, and not-for-profits to work together to establish new projects, ideas, and innovations in the aging market to make aging more sexy, to attract more younger people into the aging sector. And I started it as a business because I wanted to prove that aging could be a sustainable business enterprise as well. So we organize not just an international platform called Aging Asia Innovation Forum, but we also help to look at market intelligence in the area and also to establish strategic partnerships through an alliance program. 
And then about four and a half years ago, I decided that just trying to influence other people to do it is not enough. After studying all the models, I decided that I wanted to create an aging in place model that could serve Singapore. So I created Aspire 55, um, Asia's first virtual retirement village. Instead of building um, the large retirement villages, let me focus on what I could do. I built small clubhouses. So small clubhouses in the community, each being a family structure that will look after a group of members as they age. But the one thing that I did was to make sure that they all exercise twice a week with us. <laughs> so compulsory exercise, but it's fun. And we create a social community that's like your second family. And as a result, um, they exercise twice a week, 100% attendance for the last four years. And I will start building many more of these communities throughout Singapore as well and outside. And eventually, Aspire 55 is an ecosystem that will help to support older people to age in place at home. Because I think that in the future, um, it's an age of enablement. Um, policies have to look at enablement. Businesses also have to look at enablement as well as fun. And, and why enablement? For example, um, the KPI for a nursing home, if you can improve the health and the fitness status of an older person, let's give more funding or some incentives to that, uh, that organisation that's able to do that. Um, for ourselves as, uh, as individuals, if we take a more proactive approach to our health and we, we commit more time to exercise, insurance premiums should be adjusted accordingly. I think today there's a lot of technologies and innovations that can help to support this evidence and I hope that through platforms like this, we can meet with more partners that will help us to change the future of ageing. Thank you. Ong Chupo. Ong Chupo. We started the company in 1987. The reason I come into healthcare business is I started serving the community as a volunteer when I was in the secondary school. I was not very happy with the services provided to the old age at home at that time. Dark, dirty, and also the service personnel are not professional. So I decided at a young age, when I was in secondary school, I said, if I can, I will want to change the way of life of the senior citizens in Singapore. So after my graduations, I worked in MNCs for a few years. I saved a few, two, few, few hundred thousand dollars, invested into a nursing home with only 17 beds. First year, no customer at all, without any customer. Second year, then I have one customer. And at that time, frankly speaking, is hard time. Uh, when I was with MNC, annually I received about $100,000 of income, a 2,000cc car, and I go into a nursing home. After one year, you know, my, I broke. I got three children. Every week, I supposed to have four cans of condensed milk for them, but because of hard time, reduced to three. Secondly, we have a maid. My wife said, if you like to continue with the business, so never mind, we send the maid back home as long as we have the four wall and the rooftop. That made me go on. And second year, the first six months, every day I just you know. You know, at the time, one duck head is only 30 cents and the rice 20 cents. I take that for six months. So this is the life of an entrepreneur. Not easy, very difficult. If I give it up, I will not be able to have econ Today, I think we have close to about 1,000 beds here, a few hundred beds in Malaysia, and we are growing into China. We have also quite successfully uh, launched our service in China, and we're also looking into Vietnam. But how do we go ahead to serve our seniors with better dignity, better services? But in my life, I believe many people are talking about aging. I don't think this aging is a word that we have to be afraid of because it's in the state of mind. To me, I don't believe in aging because I share with my colleagues, if you are a lucky person, you work until the moment you collapse. That is the happiest person in life. So keep healthy, one. Secondly, never go retirement. Because you think that every day you are very healthy. And thirdly, if you need to go for retirement, 
and the most semi-retirement. And what do you do? You must have hobbies. And you do community work, social work. And thirdly, never give up any work you can. So for example, if I am able to work at my senior age, I want to contribute to share my experience with uh, universities or maybe with uh, young entrepreneurs, I want to see them successful. And secondly, to make sure that Singapore healthcare is useful to the people in the region because our market is very small. And how do we get our entrepreneurs to grow our business in ASEAN country or Asia Pacific? Because Singapore market is too small. You have senior citizens right now, about half a million. How do you grow? So I take this opportunity to urge government to support more private enterprises in healthcare, especially senior care. When they grow bigger, then they have got a strength to in inject their influence overseas. I think the government been doing very well for the past years to support VWO to take care of senior citizens. I think there was one saying, that was before 2011, you can die but you cannot get sick because everybody is scared of going to the hospital or go to the nursing home, no money. But now actually our government did a very good job, provide very good care. You know, average family income per head, 2006 and below, you qualify for subsidies from 25% to 100%. I think are all well covered. So at this time, I think government, it will be very good government support to grow local businesses so that we can provide better support to our local population and also have our influence in the region. Thank you. Thank you. Chupo, before, can I make a reservation for you to come and talk to our entrepreneurship students? <laughs> <laughs> And, you know, when you talk about healthcare and how the government is doing, you have to leave a little bit for Professor Tan. <laughs> Please, Good evening, Ivy. everyone. My name is Ivy Lai, and I'm really happy to be here to join you in this dialogue. Philips has a vision to improve the lives of 3 billion people by the year 2025, and the elderly is a significant part of this population. I think the Philips brand is very well known among consumers, but what a lot of people do not are not aware of is that we have over a hundred years of experience in healthcare as well. We are very passionate about driving the transformation of healthcare, uh, and there we're talking about really transitioning from volume-based healthcare to value-based healthcare, whereby uh, better patient outcomes can be delivered at a lower cost. And I think it is also important for us to think of healthcare not only as treating illnesses. Healthcare is really an entire continuum. It starts with healthy living, prevention, and of course, when you fall sick, then you get into the phase of diagnosis, treatment, and then going back to home care. We are also a very fervent believer in collaboration in terms of innovation. So we partner with the government, we partner with NGOs, because we believe that collaboration is key to coming up with innovative solutions to tackle the problems, complex and multifaceted problems of an aging population and its impact in healthcare systems. Not a problem that is only faced by Singapore, but by many healthcare systems around the world. Um, and we are also very actively developing digital and connected care solutions. So recent um, healthcare te technology and innovation has allowed us to move some elements of healthcare from the hospital to a home setting. And this really would benefit the elderly because then they can take better care of their health in the comfort of their home without having to always you know, be running to the hospital every other day. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, I'm Cho Chuan. I'm uh, trained as a medical doctor, but I guess in Asia now I'll be referred to as a humble administrator. I stepped down uh, from NUS and uh, in January started uh, two new roles in the Ministry of Health. Uh, the first as Chief Health Scientist and the second to uh, start a new Office for Healthcare Transformation. And uh, you probably don't know that the Office of Healthcare Transformation is the fastest growing part of MOH. It's grown 17 times since January, which means I have 17 people working with me right now. <laughs> Uh, we are uh, faced with a very exciting task of uh, working with uh, healthcare providers and many stakeholders across the ecosystem 
uh, to look at how we can further enhance our healthcare system for the future. So it's a great pleasure and honour for me to uh, be on this uh, distinguished panel. Thank you. Last but not least, okay. My name is Marianne Tao, and I came to Singapore 25 years ago to start my grandmother's um, foundation uh, that focuses on population aging. And our goal is to actually look at the well being of older people within a society for all ages. Um, I was started out as a public health pediatrician, so it was a, a rather stiff, uh, a kind of steep learning. Um, a learning curve for me, but over 25 years, I've learned a lot about what aging actually meant uh, to me. Firstly, the first 10 years, our tagline used to be called Aging with Grace and Dignity, because I bought into that half myth, half truth that aging is all, you know, silver tsunami, older people be frail, and they have all the healthcare needs, and they drain the family caregiver, they'll be consuming a lot of, like, resources of the community, and it's a drag, okay? So our role is how to develop the service models, help them live better. That was actually quite wrong, because when we started to look at the data, the vast majority of older people are actually well. This matter of fact, they continue to live in the community, they're working, they're productive. What restricted them was actually the fact that society saw them as not productive, and there's no space for them to participate or work, or be more productive as, as, as they can be. So the, the sh minds have to shift towards, well, what does it take to help people grow old well in a larger context, not just individuals or the family, but the entire society? What does it take for people to really change? And that's when I remember when I um, attended um, Professor Tan's inaugural a uh, speech as a president, he talked about the high bridge of our mind. And what stops us is the way we insist on believing aging as the myth part, which is all about silver tsunami, all about terrible things. But in fact, it really isn't. As a matter of fact, more and more the data show that people are aging later biologically and aging slower for all the advances that, you know, the nutrition and, and, and everything that we've already made with it across the board, not just Singapore, but even developing countries in the world, we're all living longer. And so the fa fact is that we keep consisting that people are not well, they will not see the opportunities. And as a doctor, we start looking at, well, what does it take for people to live well? And it's actually living long and disability free is entirely possible. We bring see that in some of the countries that disability rates are actually dropping amongst older people because what makes us sick and what makes us be not um, not and be disabled are chronic diseases like blood pressure, high blood pressure or diabetes and all those things, what we all know are preventable and manageable and certainly avoid disability that make us avoid crisis like strokes and stuff that make us disabled. So it's entirely possible for a large number of population, even to later life, with under the right healthcare system and measures for them to actually age very well. They may live with some chronic diseases, but this doesn't mean they'll be disabled. And the society shift the mindset to think that older people is also a market segment, and there are opportunities there, then things will change. So I'm just, my main point is that to everyone is to get rid of that hybrid to your mind to think that older people are all sick and poor and disabled and just drag because they're also consumers. Okay, they are consumers. They're just consumers like everybody else. And the next group of cohort coming are baby boomers. Baby boomers, I will be one, like lifestyle. We want everything. We want appropriate housing, we want travel, we want good food, we want fashion, we want whatever. Whatever you want today, we will still want as we move older. So what does the market offer you? A huge opportunity, and not just healthcare either, and not just innovation around health, it's everything. And ev everything contributes to good health. So therefore, I would say the market's wide open, so I would just say that, that, that what we need to do is dismantle that garbage of our mind of insisting and believing that aging is a drag. I think longevity is an opportunity, and I don't think Anybody here will volunteer that earlier, right? So we want to make sure that we live long life and richly. Thank you, Marianne. Uh, let's go around from here, Marianne, with you starting. Spending just two or three minutes, and just so when others would not notice, if you've exceeded the time, I'll try to clear my throat. <laughs> right? Two or three minutes, think on this topic, the business of living longer and well. What does your organization, how do you approach it? Uh, what are your thoughts on this topic? What I, the work we do? Mean? Yes. Okay, so um, I think we, the foundation does 
Okay, there's a foundation part in my family office side. There's a business side. From the foundation side, traditionally, we look at how we innovate new services. We started the first home care service and advocated to be now nationally available. We started the first care management service. We started a number of firsts. So the idea is actually being to build service models that allow older people to age well for those who need care. We also build capacity to train, and we build nursing programs. Um, and we also have a research aspect that's very important because we need new data. For instance, currently, we commissioned a study to find out what does, how much does an older person really need to live? That's reasonable. And the answers? Uh, <laughs> well, wait till October, we'll launch oh, it. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, um, so we do, and then the final thing is actually a, an experiment in Wampo whereby we take the entire community and say, what does it take for what individuals, family, and society on a community level needs to do so that everyone in Wampo age well compared to the next community that doesn't have these interventions? So that's the foundation side. And the business side is we're looking, actually, our family office looking at investments that are actually looking at, like, whether it's VC or PE, whether it's healthcare or others, that are around aging and healthcare. So, um, exciting times for, for us, actually. Thank you very much. Cho Chua? So, as has been noted, um, aging by itself is not really the issue. It's uh, the ill health, the disability, and the loss of function that is more commonly associated with, this, with aging that is the issue. So, all of us uh, know uh, it's uh, life expectancy, and in Singapore, we are very happy that our life expectancy is amongst uh, the highest in the world. Uh, but it's also this concept of health span, how many years of life you spend fully healthy and free of disability and illness. And the good news is that in Singapore, actually, our lifespan uh, is, expectancy is about 84 years old on average, and our health span is about nearly 80 years old. So. The real challenge and opportunity for us is how to increase the life, the health span, the healthy years free of disability and ill health. And I think there are several important opportunities which I like to uh, highlight, which will require uh, concerted and coordinated uh, work by the government, but also private, public, social, and other stakeholders. The first is uh, preventing ill health and disability. And uh, this sounds like an obvious thing. But if I take the example of dementia, if you look at the data from the UK, the risk of uh, somebody developing dementia 20 years ago compared with the risk of someone de developing dementia today has gone down by 20%. 20%. And uh, this is also the case in the US and in a number of other advanced economies. A big part of this is because of increasing education, because uh, increased education is uh, correlated positively with a lower risk of dementia. So all of us spending our time here talking now, we are probably uh, doing ourselves a favor by uh, delaying uh, dementia by a few minutes. <laughs> but the point is uh, that uh, dementia, which is a really feared consequence of aging, it's not an inevitable progression to greater and greater incidents and greater and greater needs in society. And therefore, we should ask ourselves, how do we come together in order to help reduce the risk of, of dementia? Now, how can dementia be reduced? And uh, in fact, uh, what has uh, been uh, shown to be helpful uh, Exercise, healthy eating, that's, uh, the second is um, uh, lifelong learning, uh, remaining curious. The, the third is really uh, mental wellness, having good, strong relationships. Uh, the fourth one is a bit difficult, avoid head injuries. So those of us who have a habit of falling down uh, should uh, take care of that. Uh, but all these are things which, uh, and the fifth of course is uh, uh, good control of risk factors like high blood pressure, diabetes, heart disease, and, 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 and uh, high lipids. So these are things which are actionable, uh, but to do this in wide, at wide scale across a very diverse uh, set of uh, individuals in a population uh, requires multi-level efforts uh, that uh, can be addressed not just by uh, the public sector, but by private sector, social enterprise, volunteers, and other stakeholders. So I think the first uh, big opportunity for us really 
is uh, prevention of ill health. And the second is uh, the shift, the necessary shift in our health delivery model. As uh, uh, individuals get older, they tend to get comorbidities, uh, many illnesses at the same time. And uh, our, hospital, our medical system in Singapore is really excellent, uh, but it's really very hospital-centric. And if we use hospitals to uh, manage uh, the multiple comorbidities associated with aging and chronic disease, then it's going to result in fragmentation of care, higher costs and greater complexity. So the average uh, person in Singapore who is above 65 is four times more likely to be hospitalised, stays longer and is likely to incur three times the cost. So if we persist with a model that we use today, where the hospital is a, a, a principal way of managing many of the conditions associated with age and chronic disease, it is going to uh, lead to higher costs without necessarily improving outcomes. In the US, uh, the average uh, patient on Medicare who is above 65 years old has seven doctors looking after him or her five of whom are specialists. Does this lead to better outcomes? It's not clear. But it certainly leads to higher complexity and to greater costs. So the great challenge and opportunity for us in our healthcare system is to shift towards more continuing care, more holistic care, uh, care which is much better integrated with social services. And... Uh, to do this, we uh, need to work together to uh, move towards a much stronger primary care system to integrate primary care and hospital care and uh, very importantly also to build the capabilities, the services and facilities for within the community to help uh, families and individuals cope with the social issues associated with ageing. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Tan. Amy? I'd like to pick up on a point uh, Professor Tan mentioned about the fact that five specialists need to attend to an elderly patient. Uh, I think with the recent advancements in healthcare technology, uh, we have actually enabled and empowered the system to stretch specialist resources further. An example would be a solution that we implemented in the US, uh, what we call tele-ICU, where specialist consultants can provide remote support to ICU patients, uh, thereby bolstering ICU bedside care teams. And the results have been extremely encouraging. Um, after the st statistical adjustments, we're talking about patients who have been admitted for seven days or more. The number of days they spend in the ICU goes down by one and the, length, the total hospital length of stay goes down by half a day. And that increases as uh, patients are admitted for longer periods of time. So if they stay, let's say if they are admitted for two weeks, we see that their total hospital length of stay goes down by one day, and the number of days they spend in ICU reduces by 2.5 days, which is actually very significant. And, and there is, is, is where we need to ensure that we are able to deliver better patient outcomes, but not at a higher cost. And, you know, the ability to be able to reduce that cost. Um, I think the other thing that can be very applicable to the elderly population is in the concept of remote healthcare, uh, where uh, we can help patients better adhere to therapy programs, treatment programs, by monitoring them remotely, 24-7, um, and, and that's one way where we can um, reduce the number of times an elderly patient needs to visit a hospital. Um, I think other areas where technology can also help the elderly patient is in the devices becoming more modular and becoming more mobile. Now, we know that, say, 60 to 70% of pneumonia patients are elderly and traditional stationary oxygen concentrators can weigh as heavy as 15 kilograms. Uh, and, and obviously patients will need to wheel it around, severely limiting their mobility. 
Um, our mobile oxygen concentrator weigh less than one third of that. It's 4.5 kilograms and you can actually carry it over your shoulder and that greatly enhances the quality of life for patients. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, I share quite fully with Professor Tan on uh, preventive and I've been talking about technologies. But then when a senior citizen got sick, need care, technologies can only provide you to become more productive, quality of care. But in the area of staffing, in Singapore actually, we are very, having a very acute shortage of healthcare worker at all levels. From nursing aides, healthcare attendants, all the way up to nurses and also doctors. And the cost is very high. Uh, many people talking about uh, home care, that is aging in place. Uh, can be a good solution, but then the problem of manpower still unsolved. Because when you are sick, you are sick. You need care, you need care. Technology can, also, can only help to improve productivity and make you more efficient and the quality. So, in the case of this right now, Singapore, uh, with this acute shortage, and we have, I think, about 70% estimated in my organization, more than 70% of the staff are from overseas, from various countries, for example, like Philippines, you know, China, even India and Sri Lanka. You know, so, uh, actually, at the end of the day, you have also communication problems, you need to bridge with cultural, cultural gap. So how do we go about addressing this problem? So I thought, uh, actually, there are various ways of encouraging our local citizens to like or to willing to take up this job. Because depending on the foreigners, or we call it foreign talents, it's not a long-term solution. So uh, can we look into, for example, we can look into like in school, how do we instill in their mind serving others is an angel's job? Because everybody can say, okay, they can take care of senior citizens, but are they providing with, are they processing with good skill to take care of senior citizens? So from young age, you got to encourage them for thinking that this is a very good job very meaningful job. Secondly, I think uh, the pay. Friendly speaking, uh, right now in the marketplace, uh, for healthcare, lower uh, level, you get one, two thousand dollars. In compared to other places, I think we, we are very low pay, so, no, so therefore, not many people are attracted to do this job. So maybe uh, schools can come in, and also society can have uh, better respect of this job. Frankly speaking, when I first run nursing home, many of my friends, oh, you run OH at home. The way they look at, oh, or, yeah, you know, you, you feel that you don't like this job. Even up to today, sometimes, although it's not so serious as before, this still exists. But then, since in 1987 we started, of course, I think we have to take this opportunity to thank uh, Spring Singapore render a lot of help and encouragement for us so we are able to do what we are today. So I think I want to share that. I think manpower problem is serious in our society and to provide better care, quality care, I think we need to have more Singaporeans to come in to serve the senior citizens because language, culture are the key for good services. Thank you. Janice? Yeah. Uh, I think so, uh, one of the big, biggest challenges is probably social isolation. Because whether we are rich or poor, we are impacted by this situation. In grandma's generation previously, um, she knew all the neighbours. She went out and she talked to everybody. In my mother's generation, she got to know lesser neighbours. And in my generation, I really don't know who's my neighbour. <laughs> So I, I think there's a lot of uh, human interaction that's required um, to enable a society to age well. And in future, when we face um, challenges such as um, more and more people having um, signs of dementia, dementia will become as, you know, as common as chronic disease management. We need to create dementia-friendly communities and have more education on not just 
people in government services knowing about dementia, but I think also the businesses acknowledging how to, how to treat people with dementia. The private banks who have a huge issue with clients who have dementia still making decisions. Um, I, I think this is just going to be an increasing societal um, issue that we have to look at. But the other thing is also traditional values of filial piety. We all want to look after our parents. Uh, whenever we see an older person we, and she falls down, you know, we want to go up to her and help her. But when I was in Japan at the Longevity Village, when an older person, age 99, fell down, she said, don't help me, let me get up myself. So I, I think it's this mindset as um, younger people as well that we want to look after them and almost bubble wrap our, our, our loved elderly. But actually, they, 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 don't, they want to do a lot of things independently. And just because children live with their parents doesn't mean they're filial. Because if their parents are alone for eight hours a day, that does not make them <laughs> look after their parents any better. And I think that there's so much um, business opportunities in an aging population from travel services because we want to have um, better more appropriate programs that increase fun activities combined with holidays and not tire a person out after a seven-day tour in New Zealand. Um, then we want to look at transportation. Um, how, how friendly is our transportation services in terms of from airlines to buses? I think Singapore can be, uh, can be this red dot on the global aging map with all different kinds of elder care innovations carried out in the country. But uh, we need to encourage more entrepreneurs to, to look at this area. I see a lot more startups in the aging sector in different countries Countries, um, many startups here as well. There's a huge startup scene today. No, I mean, but I think that more needs to be paid attention to what are the services for that silver dollar. Everybody says, oh, the silver dollar, let's go after the silver dollar. You know, baby boomers will spend money. But to get the first dollar from every baby boomer is the hardest. It might, it might take you a longer time because they need to see value. What are the services that truly help to improve an older person's life? Make them healthier, make them more independent, enable more dignity and happiness. I, I think that's just some of the uh, areas we can look at. Thank you very much, Janice. Let's start with a few questions. Um, earlier, there was this thing saying that age is just a number, so in other words, it's a mindset. But the reality is that we've structurally emphasized particular numbers as retirement ages, and that has caused, uh, um, sort of it's like switching it on and off, right? There's a, there's a big drop after a retirement age, right, uh, in terms of the activity that people do, as well as how they're engaged with the workforce, as well as from the corporate side on whether we have a responsibility of rethinking careers or workforce in a, in a way that we can reintegrate that. Can we think about retirement itself as an age, and what can companies do about uh, working with those over 65, or even whatever, 67 or 70, whatever that number is? Can we start with Marianne? Yes, yeah. or anybody else who wants to jump in? Yeah, yeah I think the obviously when we look at work, we want a competent person to do their job. I think age is sorry, a little bit irrelevant. Um, so, however, you know, the student people know why 65 became a retirement age? Why that number came from? It actually started years ago with Bismarck. Bismarck wanted this very loyal army. They want people to work very hard for him. So I told him that if you worked for me until 65, I'll give you a pension. But people died well before 65. <laughs> so that's how that number stuck. So it's an irrelevant wow. number in the current context, okay? <laughs> but, but however, I must say that there's... You but know, that's I'm, a good, good example. <laughs> So, yes, so anyhow, so it's a good incentive for people to work very hard, right? So, but work until they drop a in this instance. But, but I think that, uh, the, the, see, I, I think I mentioned earlier when we were chatting uh, with, with Jerry, is that, you know, the, the retirement age, some countries have no retirement age. U.S. has no retirement age. Um, in Singapore, of course, you, you, there are things related to age that's infrastructural, like when some retirements get, you know, get access to pension or, 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 or some of some money from a company. So, so for some people, People who, let's, I was just using an example of a chambermaid who worked very hard, it's backbreaking. So at some point, retirement to them is like they can actually walk away with some 
money and have some rest. So for some people, they work towards that number because that age meant something to them. For some of us, of course, we want to be able to work for as long as we want because we have the capability, we have the energy, we have access to a variety of things. So that number becomes a hindrance. Like in universities, you know, professors, one day they're working, next day they have, no, you know, they have to retire. And that nothing changed, right? But, but so, so for that person, it's a waste of resources. Say that today you know, can work, but tomorrow you cross a certain age and you can no longer work. And all that um, brain power is put to, 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 to waste. So I think there are various pros and cons to what sure. retirement age means. Uh, any of the panelists, can you add to what, if we take ourselves 10, 15 years from now, what would businesses look like in terms of reintegrating in the workforce? What should they be thinking of or doing so that they could be better organized to assimilate people who are over the retirement age, whatever that might be? I, I think there will be um, a lot more impetus to do so because, uh, as uh, Chupo has mentioned, uh, we are in a position where our labor growth is actually going to be very small. Yeah. And uh, if uh, it's not also supplemented by greater uh, growth in foreign talent, therefore we will actually have to uh, find new ways of uh, maximizing uh, the, the way in which talent can participate even after so-called retirement ages. And I think this mirrors a, a wider trend uh, in the nature of work in that uh, the gig economy is picking up uh, the type of uh, formal long-term uh, employment relationships are starting to shift. And uh, I, I see this retirement part uh, as actually mirroring that uh, larger shift. It, it will have, I think, uh, many implications uh, on the way we uh, educate individuals uh, in order for individuals to be able to exercise the option of uh, moving from one type of work to another yeah. and to be able to uh, find opportunities to reskill for new work. I think there will be a uh, growing need for that. I, I think it is an area that is not easy to, to fill but I think that uh, it's a very important opportunity uh, to develop. Uh, on, on the employer side, I think similarly, uh, it will create a, a much larger pressure on productivity and also on uh, new ways of engaging uh, talent because uh, of uh, the need for, for us to continue to uh, run our services at a high level. And uh, finally, I think uh, it, all this will have some implications on um, uh, the, our sort of employment-based uh, pension fund system. Uh, how do we ensure that um, this remains uh, adequate, uh, provides adequate financing after retirement if uh, people are moving re through different types of jobs, some of which might not attract employer types of uh, contributions? Anyone else wants to add? Okay. Yes, please, Marianne. Two points. I think one is that we have to think about productivity in older people and ability to earn income separately from just employment. Um, employment, of course, is a very important part. At, but however, um, older people also may want more flexibility. So I think the, the gig economy is really very important to, to kind of open up opportunity for older people with skills to offer, or service to offer, to be able to find a marketplace. But I think even for employment, the way we think about continuous retraining and, and skills and, and leisure, also the change. Um, we always think about before, you know, you, you study, 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 and then you work, 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 and then you retire, have some leisure, and you die, right? So, so that, but, but the thing is that now we actually live a very long life, and many of us will be very healthy and be able to work forever long time. So you might have to think about employment as smaller cycles. Right? Yeah. You, 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 you study, you work, and you have to, again, maybe work very hard. You make a, need a little break, a little mini retirement leisure, as I say, train again and get, you know, and, and maybe go back to work. And maybe the same job, maybe different job. So as an employer, if I want to retain my talent, I will have to allow them to take work very hard, get some of retraining, have them a little break, and go on. And some people may want to use a change to do different things, right, to change their career. So I think we need to think about employment in a very different way. Both as employer as well as employees. Thank you very much. Sure. Earlier on, I mentioned about the uh, no retirement age, don't go retirement. Uh, but if we look into the healthcare quality, 
has improved a lot and we will be able to live much longer. So one of the areas for us to have a more quality way of life is to improve our activities. For example, we need to live actively. This is one. And secondly, also, I think for the healthcare, uh, we have got to evolve because Singapore, we have got only about 700 over square kilometers. Mm -hmm. And we're going soon, maybe we will, sorry, I'm just speculating, maybe we will have got about 7 million populations. So land become very expensive. The number is six, uh, the number is six. <laughs> yeah. So I, I say speculating, maybe six. So the land become very expensive. And actually, every inch of space become expensive and you cannot provide big space for our senior citizens. So actually, one of the good ways is we see the Japanese, you see the Europeans, Europeans they go outside country to say. In fact, uh, I run uh, this uh, center in Johor. The space that we have compared to Singapore, they pay the same dollars, Malaysian ringgit and sing. At the end of the day, their space allocated to them is double than what we have in Singapore. Secondly, the cost is only about less than 50% of what we pay in Singapore. So actually, in the longer term, let's say 15 years down the road, I think we need to start to change our thinking because we are talking about living with uh, good quality after retirement or in case we are sick. Actually, we've got to find alternative. But of course, Singapore is still our home. So we cannot fix ourselves to a traditional thinking. We must stay in Singapore, Asia in Singapore, everything in Singapore. We need to have a more global outlook and global thinking. Thank you. Thank you, Chupo. Uh, for a minute, I thought you were selling land in Iskandar, but uh, <laughs> maybe, maybe I didn't get I that. I just put a good example. <laughs> All right. Uh, uh, to stick to that point, not about Iskandar, but about financing our living longer. Um, we have a program here on, with uh, City, Gro uh, City Group and uh, Mastercon and financial inclusion, social inclusion, and so forth. And we sort of build this model where we say, you know, you have to save up front and all of those things. I'm just wondering how you think, is that changing in how people are financing their living longer and how are they financing it? I'm just opening it up for a discussion. If they have to come to your uh, healthcare unit, uh, Chupo, I'm sure they have to have some money, right? But I'm just wondering, how are they financing it? Actually, you're a senior citizen, when they have no money, they have no money. <laughs> so it's a money problem. So the one to take care of the senior citizen, because they are citizens, the country got to take care of them. So in this case, how do we develop a social system to ensure all our citizens to be well care of. Otherwise, it, it, it will become a social problem. In fact, in China, they are talking about social harmony. Taking care of senior citizens is their first priority. Thank you. Marianne, you have a different view? She's well, shaking well, no, her head? No, I'm no? not shaking my view. I'm just kind of thinking. <laughs> 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 I think we need money to live a reasonable, decent life, and we need money to cover disasters like health care. And over the last 20 plus years, talking with seniors, um, the biggest concern really is health care and long-term care. Not like I got sick today, I broke my hip, I go to the hospital, I get treated, my insurance covers me and all that kind of stuff. I come home and get rehabilitated. But you have a permanent disability. It's that kind of thing, and you need care day to day until you die, and sometimes you can live for many, many years with disability requiring care, long-term care, and die. So it's really that that worries people. So if you expect people to save enough for that, that's tough, because most people will not have that problem. Yeah. But, but you can't expect everyone to save enough in case they have long-term care for 10 years towards the end of their life. So I think that we, no, countries haven't quite figured that out, um, but, but I, I think that there needs to be some kind of pulled risk insurance thing for long-term care because otherwise it's just too difficult. I think babies born every year, the moment yeah. they're born, they should put a dollar in their account or something so that, you know, like when they give a little bit when it's younger and then put in more when they're, old, yeah. when they're working and then drop the premium when they're old later. But it's a difficult thing, but we need to figure that out because we can't expect everyone to save that much. No one to be 
the economy would be flat, no one would be spending money on anything. Yeah. So I think that's important. I think the other thing, of course, is just amount of money to live. In Singapore, I think we have the benefit of good housing policy. So people don't worry about not having a roof over their head, and they think that that's how much it costs to eat. So people do need to work longer, be for satisfaction as well as of the additional income for leisure. But um, but I think there are, are, are social... Um, uh, sort of a so social security safety net with Medisafe we, and, and, and CPF is, is, is good, but people still need to save more. I think that is important. So I remember a conversation where uh, somebody asked a question to DPM uh, Tharman and, uh, about social safety nets, and he said, we don't do safety nets, we do trampolines, <laughs> right? <laughs> so so, so, so I, I, I recall that vividly when you said that, but... Uh, I'm also thinking about our spending on healthcare. Um, uh, the conversations when we think of the NHS in the UK and the billions of pounds that go into it and not adequate delivery with a model of safety net kind of model, right? Uh, um, our spending on healthcare is about 4.6% of GDP. Uh, Judge Wan, can you have uh, any insight on that? Well, first, maybe I just add on to what uh, uh, Marianne has just said, and I, I think the we, we, we do need to expand the role of insurance and risk pooling uh, in financing. Yeah. And in fact, we are seeing this, right? Because if you think about uh, uh, CPF Life, which is an annuity that uh, pays out lifelong, uh, it's, it's really a, a risk pooled uh, funding system, MediShield Life, uh, CashShield Life. Uh, we are making much greater use now of uh, risk pooling as a way to um, enable greater coverage I would say that uh, there's also a strong uh, cohort effect because uh, uh, today, of course, uh, people entering the work and uh, starting their CPF uh, payments uh, are, are earning higher wages. Yeah. Uh, and therefore, over time, if they start early enough and they save uh, sufficiently, uh, they would have a, at least a basic level of uh, adequacy uh, when they uh, reach 65 or, or beyond. Uh, and the cohorts uh, today that are exposed because when they started working, Singapore was a second or third world country, and now they are retiring into a first world uh, country with first world costs. Uh, I would say that uh, a whole slew of uh, uh, subsidy schemes and, and uh, um, pioneer generation schemes have actually... Uh, been put out to address these things, right? Uh, I think it's also very important at the same time to try to ensure that uh, even as uh, we uh, grow these uh, financing schemes, that we keep basic costs uh, reasonable. Uh, in other words, uh, what must we do in order to get more value uh, out of uh, our system? And uh, you, uh, Ivy had uh, spoken about from volume to value or in the words of our Minister for Health, from quality to value. And value really is a concept which has really taken hold uh, throughout the world today, and that is how to improve outcomes while reducing costs. And uh, there are many ways in which that can be done, and I would say that uh, part of uh, the work that we have uh, to really focus on going forward is uh, how to continually increase the value uh, in our healthcare expenditure so that we can uh, get really the best bang for the bucks that we can get good outcomes at a lower cost. Because eventually, if we can keep costs lower, then uh, we would uh, reduce the need to put away so much savings in order to uh, address high bills and catastrophic types of uh, medical events. Thank you. And, and I think there's some element of what you're talking about is pooled risk comes under threat with new technologies. So think about artificial intelligence, uh, pharmacogenomics, uh, gene testing, personalized medicine, whatever. So predictive personalized medicine, right? So when you're talking about saying a person X will get, a uh, tendency to get cancer is 90% by the year, whatever, right? Uh, do you think technology is fraying sort of at the sort of uh, destroying a little bit this pooled risk model when we think about uh, artificial intelligence and insurance, car insurance, for example. We're able to say, hey, if you drive less, then you uh, 
or drive safely, then you're able to pay lower insurance, right? But uh, uh, how does this technology itself, I wonder if Chochuan and Ivy, you've got something to add? Yeah, I think there are several elements to your question. Uh, the first is, um, the uh, uh, can technologies um, be used in a way that combine in financing incentives actually drive for better behaviours, right? So in the case of uh, cars, you know, have less accidents. In case of health, keep healthy, uh, focus on preventative care. And so a great deal of our focus really has to be on uh, creating the right incentive structure that uh, promotes uh, the adoption of uh, primary preventative actions as opposed to just paying for um, treating things that you could have prevented earlier, right? And there are many ways in which we could uh, drive this. So that's one element of, of that. But there's another element which is, uh, in the case of precision medicine, uh, it depends on how we try to direct the power of R&D uh, towards improving healthcare. And uh, part of the work we are trying to do in Singapore, working with uh, the researchers and the clinicians, is uh, to try to direct some of our precision medicine research efforts towards improving outcomes or reducing costs. Yeah. How could you possibly do that? I, I maybe give you two quick examples. One is uh, you can reduce uh, unpredictable types of uh, severe complications. So some uh, Asians who take uh, uh, treatment for fits uh, get severe rash. It's very life-threatening. It incurs a lot of costs. Uh, now we have a genetic test which is uh, developed in Singapore that can identify people at high risk of this uh, drug reaction. And uh, by having this test before you are prescribed this medication, we have seen now a sharp decline in this very severe complication. So reducing severe side effects uh, is good for patients, it's good for the health system, it saves money. Uh, the second could be to try to predict who would respond better to treatment. So if you look at uh, the 10 best-selling prescription drugs in the US today, for every patient that benefits from the drug, between 3 to 24 patients have no benefit. Except we don't know until we give you the drug. Then we, tell, we can tell whether you have benefits or not, right? So if you are able to find tests which would better identify which patients would benefit and which patients would not benefit, then we can avoid unnecessary usage of drugs and so on, right? So there are different strategies that could be adopted through which precision medicine can actually increase value, uh, improve outcomes or reducing costs. And uh, if we uh, search for these opportunities, and hopefully we'll be able to find somewhere we can have some broad-based application which is useful for Singapore. But you'll still need a safety net of some form, right, for those who do. Ivy, do you have something to add on that? Yeah, I'd like to talk a little bit about adaptive intelligence. Uh, and what is adaptive intelligence? It is actually combining the power of artificial intelligence and other technologies with the clinical, operational, uh, and contextual domain knowledge of humans to better analyze data. What this means is that clinicians who are then faced with a huge amount of data on individual patients, they can make better sense of what this data means and allowing them to better, not only to better diagnose, but to maybe even uh, personalize treatment plans for patients. And I believe that there is a huge, a tremendous amount of, of insights that we can harness from this kind of data analytics to aid and to enhance first-time right diagnosis instead of sending a patient for five scans before you finally you know, figure out what is wrong with the patient. And um, with big data analytics, technology today is also available for fall detection. I think the first generation of fall detection uh, pendants that patients wear, there is an emergency button where if the patient falls down, you press the button and it, it sends an alert to a response center. The problem, of course, is that if someone faints and falls down, then having that button doesn't really help. But big data analytics have allowed um, uh, the device to detect that someone has fallen and to yeah. send a response yeah. immediately. 
And even more so than that, we are now able to predict within a 30-day window that this person is going to have a fall okay. because of the way the person walk, because of the way the person is leaning. And that technology alone in the US have prevented 200,000 falls. And what all this means is that we, are, we will be able to uh, reduce the healthcare bills and um, uh, allowing also insurance companies to have lesser payouts. But I think the, the, the part of the issue is that we also need to look at how we structure financial mechanisms surrounding healthcare. Mm. Because I think today, um, we look at insurance as paying bills when you fall sick. We are not incentivized for taking good care of our health. In fact, I hear people asking, what is the purpose of going for an annual checkup? Because if you find out something is wrong with you, you get loaded on your premiums. Uh, but that, I think that kind of thinking needs to change, that we need to incentivize people for taking better care of their health. It all starts with healthy living. It all starts with prevention. And that is, I think, the most economical way of taking care of this complex problem. Okay. Thank you very much. I'm going to open it up for questions on the floor. Um, I'm sure some... Yes? Uh, just here first. Yeah. So, since she's there already, why don't she give you the microphone? Yes. Um, two points. Uh, uh, I, sir, uh, can yeah, you keep the question yes. smaller than the answer, of shorter course, than the answer? Of course. <laughs> Insurance premium, right? It's a one way street. That's a problem. If the government can come up with a rebate, if you are healthy for X number of years, that might be an example for people to live healthy rather than going and draw on your premium down, right? Second thing is I would like Professor Tan, if possible, to share a bit about what MOE is trying to do at the existing Alexandra, the idea of the cradle-to-grave concept case study rather than going for primary, secondary, tertiary care when you need it. Thank you. The Elevator pitch answer to that, uh, <laughs> because in the interest of uh, time. Uh, in the case of uh, uh, Alexandra Hospital, uh, uh, MOH is uh, working on a, a test precinct uh, and to uh, create a sandbox where you're going to test a few things. Uh, we, meaning uh, National University Health System, working in Ministry of Health. The first is uh, whether we can have a single team looking after patients with chronic, with multiple conditions within the hospital. So one care team that looks after you from the beginning to the end and uh, providing you holistic care uh, in, instead of having five or six specialists. The second is um, to do zero-based care redesign, redesigning from scratch so that we uh, try to see what is the core thing that we must stress and what are the peripheral things that actually the, 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 the things that are not important can be removed. And the third is a much better integration with the community, which means uh, really that when a patient is discharged, they go to a named primary care physician that then looks after this person together with the social services. And eventually, uh, the aspiration is that when that patient is then readmitted, they can be readmitted directly back into Alexandra rather than going through an A&E. So the idea is really to uh, create a holistic and uh, integrated way in which patients can, be, uh, can go through the system with uh, smooth handovers between the different operators. Now, we are just uh, really on the first steps of a very long journey, uh, and uh, we will be uh, actually announcing more of these things as time goes. Yeah. Uh, one more question here. If it comes from a former minister, I'm not sure if it's a loaded question or an easy question. <laughs> ah, well, with your indulgence, uh, Jerry. Um, since it's Ramadan, so I just would start, like to start with blessings. And I think Swan will know, I sacrificed my sumptuous breaking of fast <laughs> to, to be, be here. here. Because uh, I owe a lot to Professor Tan, because I serve under him for the National Medical Ethics Committee. So my question is related to a question with Jenny's race about values and uh, how do we look at aging. Um, 
I thought one of the best ways to live uh, longer and well is to be a politician. <laughs> <laughs> like Swan mentioned the example up north. But provided you don't lose, <laughs> which I did <laughs> in the elections. But uh, nothing, uh, not all is lost when you lose the election because if you know what life is all about, at least we come to the values. I, whenever I see young couples, I always encourage them to have children because make their grandparents happy. Make their parents happy. I'm a much happier person now, a new life because I have five grandchildren. Yeah. And it's all to do about what kind of life do you look for. When we discuss this, I get the feeling sometimes that we are a bit secular in our approach to things. And that's why I come to the question of values. Spirituality is a very important part of aging. A lot of our people have some form of beliefs or religion, and religion will have an important part to play in terms of their aging process. And I think that must be factored in. But my quite real question is about the values. Do you think that our society, from individuals to families to government, have the right, employers included, have the right kind of values in facing this challenge of living longer and well and aging? Do we have the kind of value systems? Do we, we can have the best of homes, the best of medical care, but if your children, your grandchildren don't care about you, it's going to be a miserable life. And if the government doesn't care, you heard about the argument, you know, the ratio of our reserves to our GDP, <laughs> where the more could be spent for welfare, for health care, whether our value system is also in the right place. What is the fine balance for that? Values, spirituality, and the secular system that we have in place to provide that chances, better chances of living longer and living well. Thank you. Yeah, I, I just want to thank you for raising the issue because in the end of the day, all the healthcare in the world is not going to give us purpose or meaning in our lives. And I think that most of us when we're younger, the purpose seems clear. We have to study, get to university, have to get that job, have to have the baby. You know what I mean? It's sort of chasing that. But when you get to the older life, then it really is when the children are grown and all that, what is a purpose? I think in Singapore, we have, as my grandmother said, when she started foundation, she said that modern society is unkind to old age because somehow they've taken away their role and place in society and no longer the respect. Working with older people, so many of them tell us I have no, no reason for living, but I wake up the next day, what for? I walk them, look at the four walls, what is my meaning? I want to be able to learn something, do something interesting, learn, contribute something, and have a purpose in my life. And this is something that's not about healthcare, it's about really societal values and an intergenerational solidarity. I worry a lot, because in our generation, there's that connectivity where the older generation is pretty solid. The next generation, I'm not sure. Recently, I had a little dinner with some of our colleagues, and then some of them brought their children. So <laughs> we're talking about our old age, what we will do and all. And then one of them, a 15-year-old son said, don't worry, mom, when you grow old, I'll find you the, find you the best nursing home. <laughs> <laughs> and he meant it totally sincerely, okay? And this is how things have come. So um, I think the other thing about really about living long and living well is this recent, um, 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 well, it's not a recent study, this is Harvard study, been going for almost 80 years. They started in 1938, they've been monitoring this 800, start with 800 young men. 400 of them were like, privileged Harvard sophomores, and 400 were from the poorest part of Boston. So they've been interviewing these men every year since 1938, scanning them, doing blood tests and all that. And they found many things, but the key things to living longer and healthier and happier life is that at 50 years old, these men said that they had, were happy with their social relationships and be able to maintain that in their life. So that was actually what kept them happy, happier and healthier and living longer. So in many ways, it's also related to does our societal values support that and encourage that? Do we give them time to go home after work and develop and, and invest in those relationships? Or we ex expect people to work, 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 and work long hours, and they have no time to invest in their well-being and their family relationships. So I think that is something of a very important question that we need to really debate, because as whether it's employers, some, some, some employers expect the staff to work to seven, eight, nine o'clock at night, and things like that. So we do really have to think about that. Thank you. George Wan? Maybe I just add a, 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 so I think thanks for a very, very important question. There's also a, 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 another side of this, which is the individual's 
mental resilience uh, and positiveness. And uh, I uh, was talking to a, a colleague of mine who runs the Super Centenarian Cohort in uh, Tokyo. These are people who are 110 years old. And I asked him, uh, is there anything unusual about these 110 year olds? And he said, yeah, they're all very positive. They, they may not be rich, uh, but they are contented, they are very positive. Uh, so I think the, the, the other aspect of this is that uh, I think we can also do more to cultivate uh, mental wellness, positive thinking and mental resilience at an early age because we live in an uncertain world. And while we certainly, I, I do agree, we certainly have to work to preserve values, to enable people to develop the close relationships that uh, are necessary for healthy aging and health span. Uh, at the same time, we can also help individuals become more able to uh, withstand the sorts of vicissitudes of uh, uh, the trials and tribulations that they meet. Uh, and the two taken together, I think, might give us a better chance of succeeding. Thank you. Uh, that was very good. Thank you. Um, any other question? This person here. Testing. Hi, my name is Elvin. I run a family business. I'm not in the business of um, aging at all. Um, I have a question. Uh, do, do the, Singapore is a special place. It's a red dot. We're small. We, we manage very well. Um, and we live very long and we live very healthily as you have established. Uh, do the elderly here, are they different from the elderly um, around the region or around the world? Um, in, the, in terms of how they look at themselves. For example, um, my stereotype is that when I speak to um, elderly, they say, oh, we are old already, we cannot do this, you know, we shouldn't fall in love, you know, it's, it, it's people will look at us. At the same time, so one question is, do the elderly look at themselves differently from other elderly in, in the world? And number two, do the society view the elderly different? Meaning that we take so much care for them. Um, for example, my mother will go all out to avoid staircases. So she doesn't walk up staircase. The only stairs she walks up is in my house and she has to help. No, she has, I allow her to help me make my bed on the, on the weekend, right? To change the sheets. Because it's the only exercise she does walking up the steps. Um, I don't seem to see this phenomena in the region, especially in Asian cities. And you've mentioned um, about uh, uh, being positive. Are, are our elderly less positive or as positive as the rest. And um, to the point where if you are old and your children look after you, this, the example I had is that when I was in Scotland, I met two very elderly ladies and I asked them the same question, who take care of, who take care of you when you fall down? We take care of ourselves, no problem. Sir, right? sir, question, yeah. sir. So, so are they different? Nah? Are we different from the rest? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> What, what we see the idea of elderly like what age do you see someone who's elderly yeah. because somebody who you know they get the, the senior citizen pass today they at 60 years old you get questioned and stopped by the conductor are you really 60 years old because nobody looks their age anymore and if we look around the other cities in Asia and how older people are being treated I think it's also how the physical environment is enabling them to live a good life. Shopping centres, for example, are there enough seats that are being provided so that older people are able to sit down more or, or mothers with children are able to sit down more? Do we see the older people population as a contributing factor to our economy or do we say, no, we don't want to have so many people sitting around? Uh, you, know, is it, you know, we want them to... But then if you don't do that, look at Japan. Um, Japan has um, older people-friendly malls and they built a lot of... Um, chairs and seats and services around servicing the older person population. They, they have supermarkets that serve packs in small portions to serve older people population and not sell things in bulk because, you know, older people, we don't, in small family structures, you don't need as much. So I think the question we should be asking ourselves as society is how are we providing the best physical, emotional environments for our older people to age well? Janice, with that, I think I'm going to close uh, this evening's uh, discussion because we're running out of time. A and I think you've captured the essence of it. Are we providing uh, uh, an excellent physical, uh, social environment where we are allowing people to live longer, meaningful, and more impactful lives? Uh, there were several comments that were raised uh, this, this evening's panel. Um, technology as an opportunity, 
uh, uh, as uh, the discussion in terms of health, preventing ill health and the shifting of the healthcare delivery models. Uh, th they, these are things to think about. This issue of talent and encouraging young people to think of these occupations because at some point this would become uh, a critical issue going forward. Uh, there are two things that stuck with me, this idea of value versus cost in, in, in what we do. A and the second one, given that I'm a dean of the business school and an SMU, this idea of lifelong learning and remaining curious. For those of you who want courses, we've got the SMU Academy. <laughs> on, the, on that, thank you very much to our lovely panel, and uh, thank you very much for being here this evening. Hi, ladies and gentlemen, regrettably, we must now bring you know, this session to an end. And thank you very much for uh, listening and for the active discussion that went on. Um, thank you again to the distinguished panelists and the moderator. Uh, please remain on stage uh, as, we, as I now invite uh, Mr. Lee Swanghyun to come up um, on stage to present a token appreciation to all of you. And we will have a uh, group photograph. On behalf of the EDB Society and SMU, thank you all for joining us this evening. Uh, we look forward to welcome you back for our fifth forum, and it's on the uh, it's on 24th, uh, 21st of August, and it's a very yummy theme: uh, food and agri tech. So, see you all then, and have a pleasant evening. <laughs>